This recording is part one of three of the anatomy of the nervous system. Our journey of the nervous system is going to start with the development of the nervous system. And we're going to start from the point of the embryonic disc that's about the third week of life where we see three primary germ layers already in existence after conception. Again, this is around week three where we see ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. This is at the end of a process known as gastrulation. Gastrulation sets up the framework of the embryo to begin a process known as organogenesis, which is the creation of organs and organ systems. And you'll notice that at the end of gastrulation, we have a special collection of cells that runs the length of the axis of this embryo called the notochord within the mesoderm. And it's the cells within the notochord that are going to send out chemical signals to basically induce the ectoderm on the dorsal surface to proliferate in terms of the numbers of the cells and also start to fold inward. So basically what we're seeing so far is there's a portion of the ectoderm, because it's not the entire part, but a portion of the ectoderm, the dorsal region, that's going to differentiate into an area called the neuroectoderm. There are molecular signals, so basically the notochord is sending out chemicals in the form of you know, different molecules that will signal and cause the cells of the ectoderm to form a special structure that is known as the neural plate. As these cells change shape, they fold inward and they create a neural groove, which continues to fold in even more, producing a neural fold. And eventually, as the neural folds come together, they produce a neural tube. Now you'll notice there are some special cells in darker purple that make up a structure known as the neural crest. The neural crest cells are going to migrate and give rise to cranial, spinal, sympathetic ganglia, which are collections of nerve cell bodies. Uh, and their associated nerves, and also to special cells of the adrenal uh, medulla, which is the inner portion of the adrenal gland, called chromaffin cells, and also to pigment cells of the skin, and they also contribute to some of the connective tissues. So uh, the neural tube is basically done by day 20 of, of life. That's how quickly this all comes together. So as the nervous system develops a neural tube, it's not just a simple hollow tube, it's actually filled with fluid. And it goes from the anterior end of the embryo to the posterior end. The anterior end is sometimes referred to as rostral because it's towards the snout, it's being the snout. Um, about 25 days of development, the anterior end develops into the brain and the posterior end develops into the spinal cord. So as the neural tube has cells that continue to divide and grow, we see different structures starting to take shape including three primary brain vesicles. Now you remember the word vesicles, just like a container. And these primary brain vesicles surround and contain fluid. If we jump all the way over to the far right-hand side of this picture, you'll see 
the adult regions that contain fluid when everything is said and done. Now, these are fluid-filled spaces in the brain and the spinal cord. And we see the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, I'll disappear for a second, the cerebral aqueduct, the fourth ventricle, and the central canal. Those are fluid-filled regions. And you can see that after the three primary brain vesicles, we have secondary brain vesicles as these cells continue to grow and divide and things change shape and form into different structures because we've got more cells that are developing as this grows. So we can see that things change shape and develop even more with the secondary brain vesicles. And then finally, we get to adult brain structures. So let's look at the three primary brain vesicles and see what they turn into. The prosencephalon, or forebrain, is going to wind up turning into the cerebrum, which is the brain as you know it. It's that thing that looks like a walnut that has all those ridges and grooves and even a little ridge in between the two hemispheres. So this includes the cerebral hemispheres, um, each of which has a cortex, white matter, and basal nuclei. Then inferior to the cerebrum is a special structure called the diencephalon, which includes structures such as the thalamus, the hypothalamus. Remember the word hypo means under or below. So guess where you find the hypothalamus? Below the thalamus. The epithalamus and the retina. Remember, epi means above. Then we have the mesencephalon or midbrain. Now, in um, inferior to your, to your cerebrum and the diencephalon is the brainstem. The brainstem includes three structures, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So notice how the mesencephalon remains the mesencephalon, and mes means middle. It remains the midbrain the entire time. Hmm. Midbrain or mesencephalon stays that way the entire time. It grows and changes as it's developing, but it remains just that one structure. And then lastly, we have the rhombencephalon or hindbrain, which is going to be the rest of the brain, which includes the, the pons and the medulla oblongata. And it also includes a special structure called the cerebellum. The term cerebellum literally means little brain. And then lastly, we have this region just uh, posterior to that, which makes up the spinal cord. Now, when we look at the development of the spinal cord, this is coming from the posterior aspect of the neural tube, which is that fluid-filled neural tube. Now, because it is a tube, it forms a canal for the fluid called the neural canal. And remember those neural crest cells? We see that right here. So there is a dorsal and ventral aspect to the neural tube. The surface side is the dorsal aspect. The deep side is the ventral aspect. And as we see these cells continuing to grow and divide to make more of themselves, we see differentiation occurring where the cells of the neural tube wall start to turn into neurons and glial cells. And the dorsal tissues end up having sensory functions. And the ventral tissues end up having motor functions. When I teach this in lab, I always say sneak sensory in the back door and motor out the front door to catch the bus. 
okay? So dorsal or posterior is going to be sensory, sneak sensory in the back, and then the ventral or anterior motor out the front door. Spina bifida is a condition where the vertebral arches are not formed correctly. Either the lamina or that fuse together to form the spinous processes are missing or the spinous processes simply have not fused together properly. And a bifid spinous uh, would be evident if those arches don't fuse together. This often occurs or more commonly occurs in the lumbosacral region of the spine. And if it is severe, then the person is at risk to infection due to leakage of cerebrospinal fluid or rupture of the meninges. The meninges are uh, layers of connected tissue that surround the brain and the spinal cord. In the past, 70% of these cases were caused by a lack of folic acid in the mother's diet. And that's why they've put a lot of folic acid into different products like bread and flour and pasta, so they call it enriched. And depending on the extent of the spina bifida, surgery is may or may not be required. Spina bifida occulta means that it's not that bad because the spina bifida is pretty, pretty well hidden. You see that on the far left picture. And here there's no herniation of the nerves or the meninges, the connective tissue layers that go around the spinal cord. So that's really usually not a problem. Spina bifida vera, which is very noticeable, um, may in include a process known as a meningocele, where the connective tissue layers, the meninges around the spinal cord herniate outward, and you've got this fluid-filled sac of meninges that have kind of pushed through. Um, a myelomeningocele not only includes the meninges, but also some of the nerves of the spinal cord. So in spina bifida vera, that usually requires surgery, uh, the earlier the better, and uh, may require a shunt for the cerebrospinal fluid to keep it from collecting outside the body. And some people who have spina bifida may experience functional loss. Overall life expectancy is normal depending on the extent of the spina bifida. Sometimes people end up in wheelchairs for the rest of their lives and being confined to a wheelchair comes with its own challenges because if people have, uh, if they develop pressure sores from being in wheelchairs, then they're at risk for septicemia. So that's a whole other ball game in that particular case. So let's take a look at the brain as most people think of it. It looks kind of like a walnut and it is made up of two halves or hemispheres called the cerebral hemispheres. Now the cerebral hemispheres are separated for a majority of the structure until they reach an area known as the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum connects both halves of the two cerebral hemispheres. And so if you were to separate the two cerebral hemispheres at the longitudinal fissure, you would separate it until you got to this point down here where the corpus callosum, which is basically made up of myelinated axons, white matter, connects those two cerebral hemispheres together. Now the cerebrum has different functions that include things like memory and consciousness and emotion. And the outer portion of the cerebral hemispheres is made up of gray matter because the cerebral cortex, which is the outer portion, remember the outer portion of an organ is the cortical portion or cortex, and then the inner portion is usually the medullary portion. 
So the outer portion or cerebral cortex is made up of unmyelinated cell bodies and dendrites of neurons. So it's gray matter. And then the inner portions of the cerebrum that are myelinated make up the tracks. And then within the cerebral hemispheres, we also have collections of unmyelinated soma and dendrites forming what are called the deep nuclei. This includes the basal nuclei, the basal forebrain, and the limbic system. So that's gray matter that's deeper inside the cerebral hemisphere. So let's take another look at the cerebral cortex. Remember, it's the outermost layer of gray matter making up the most superficial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere. And here we can see that longitudinal fissure between the two halves of the cerebral hemispheres. And here is that portion that connects the two halves known as the corpus callosum. So that helps to connect the two halves of the cerebral hemispheres. And you'll notice that there are ridges that look like worms on the surface of the cerebrum. The ridges are called gyri, and then the little grooves in between the ridges are called sulci. A sulcus is a groove. So the wrinkles that we see on the surface of the cerebrum give it increased surface area so that there's more area for the cell bodies and dendrites of neurons to live. Remember, if you increase folding, you have increased surface area. We saw increased surface area with microvilli on the surface of cells for increased absorption. However, with the brain, it just means we've got more neurons to have a place to live. That's a good thing. The cerebral cortex, by the way, is pretty thin. It's only two to four millimeters uh, thick. So if you can imagine an M&M, which is a centimeter in diameter, half of that is five millimeters. So another half of that, a quarter of a diameter of an M&M, is two and a half millimeters. So that's about how thick the cerebral cortex is. When we look at the lobes of the cerebral cortex, we can see anteriorly the frontal lobe. Where do you think you'd find that in terms of the skull? Oh, just deep to the frontal bone, maybe? Then we have parietal lobes. Wait, where would we find that? <laughs> yeah, deep to the parietal bones. And guess what? Here's an occipital lobe and a temporal lobe. Now, you'll notice that there is a fifth lobe that is called the insula that is deep to the frontal and temporal lobes. There is a special groove that separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And this is also a special landmark. This is known as the central sulcus. The central sulcus is important because it literally is the defining territory between the primary motor cortex and the primary somatosensory cortex, which are these ridges just anterior to and posterior to the central, central sulcus. And the cerebral cortex has been divided into 52 different regions belonging to these five distinct lobes, the frontal, the parietal, the occipital, the temporal, and the insula. Um, and so these different areas of the cortex have also been mapped out according to their functions. Let's take a closer look at the cerebral cortex. 
Remember in the last slide, I said there was this important landmark called the central sulcus. This divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And there is a special gyrus. Remember that's that worm-like or ridge-like structure. And the gyrus just anterior to the central sulcus is referred to as the precentral gyrus. This is the gyrus, the, the wormy-like ridge, just in, in front of or anterior to the central sulcus. And the precentral gyrus contains the cell bodies and dendrites of pyramidal cells, otherwise known as cortical neurons, that form special tracks called corticospinal tracks. Everything's in the name, from the cortex of the brain to the spine. Remember, motor information, which is efferent with an E, is descending from the cortex of the brain down towards the spinal, tra spinal cord. So that's where we see our primary motor cortex is found in the precentral gyrus. This is where we have control of voluntary movements. And we see pyramidal cells or cortical neurons forming those corticospinal tracts. There are also individual pyramidal neurons that control muscles that work together these are synergists. Synergists help one another so that we have more efficient movement. And you'll also notice in this frontal lobe, not only do we have the primary motor cortex, but we also have the pre-motor cortex, which helps plan movements for the neurons in the primary motor cortex. We also see in this area, there is the frontal eye field that helps control movements of the eyes, as well as a special area called Broca's area of speech, which is outlined by these little dashes on your picture here. Broca's area of speech helps produce the motor action of speaking. Again, we've got the premotor area in the frontal lobe that helps plan movement and control voluntary actions. These actions will depend on sensory feedback, such as piano playing or typing. Broca's area of speech is only found in the left hemisphere, and this is motor for speech. Remember, we have the frontal eye field as well which will help control motions for eye movement. So all these motor areas are found anterior to the central sulcus. The primary motor cortex is in the precentral gyrus, which is that ridge just anterior to the central sulcus. In terms of Broca's area of speech, if an individual has uh, damage to that area of the cortex on the left side of the brain due to a stroke, then the person will know what he wants to say, but he won't be able to get the words out and may sound something like, <laughs> And it's really frustrating for individuals who have that kind of damage because that person knows what he wants to say, he just can't form the words that are required for speech. And what's kind of interesting is that uh, they discovered that when people can't form words to speak, if they integrate the temporal lobe uh, in terms of producing sound with song, they can often sing when they can't speak. This is going to take us back to the central sulcus where we have that 
division between the frontal and parietal lobes. Remember I said with the spinal cord, sneak sensory out the back, I'm sorry, sneak sensory in the back door, motor out the front to catch the bus. So the motor stuff comes from the front of the brain as well. It's not just the spinal cord, it's also the brain. However, if we sneak sensory in the back door, well, sensation is going to come from mostly the posterior portion that is posterior to the central sulcus. So just like we had our primary motor cortex immediately anterior to the central sulcus, we have our primary somatosensory cortex just posterior to the central sulcus in the post-central gyrus, which is that wormy-like, ridge-like structure just immediately posterior to the central sulcus. So this is within the parietal lobe, and this helps integrate sensory input from receptors in the skin and proprioceptors. So you know what receptors in the skin tell you? Things like temperature, pressure, vibration, uh, all different kinds of things about touch, including texture, uh, pain. Proprioceptors are special receptors that tell you where your body is in space. And there are proprioceptors located throughout our bodies. They're in joints, they're in muscles, um, and these proprioceptors, again, help us know where our body is in space. It's what allows a gymnast to understand where he or she is in a tumbling uh, routine to know when to unfold and land on his or her feet. If I were to stand up, okay, and I know you can't see what I'm doing now, I'm just going to stand on, on one foot. Okay, now my eyes are using a writing reflex, so I know where I am in space, but watch what happens when I close my eyes. Now my proprioceptors have to work a lot harder for me to stand upright. And they're really important also in terms of rehabilitation. So uh, if anybody's going into physical therapy, rehabilitation of proprioceptors is actually really important in terms of getting stability back in the body after an injury. And that's why wobble boards are really useful in terms of physical therapy and rehab. So again, we've got the primary somatosensory cortex just posterior to the central sulcus, and it is in the post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe integrating sensory input from receptors in the skin as well as proprioceptors. Now you'll notice that there are other things going on posterior to the central gyrus that have to do with sensation, so let's take a look at those. So we have our primary somatosensory area where information gets sent to the cortex to be, to be perceived we also have a somatosensory association cortex, which is going to take that information and integrate it and compare it to uh, what's being felt to get a better understanding. And this is just posterior to the primary somatosensory area. We also have a primary visual area, which receives visual information from the retina, which is the nervous tissue in the back of the eye that gets sent to the occipital lobe. And there's also a visual association area that uses information from our past to help interpret what we're seeing and help us recognize different things like faces. And the visual association area is also in the occipital lobe. And we have an auditory area in the temporal lobe that helps to interpret sound, but the auditory association area in the temporal lobe helps us to compare that with things that we've experienced in the past to interpret new sounds. And again, that's in the temporal lobe. Let's take a look at this on a picture. You'll get a better understanding. So here we have our primary 
somatosensory area in the post central gyrus, which is that worm like structure just posterior to the central sulcus. So that's our primary somatosensory cortex. And then here we have the somatosensory association cortex. So it's, it's basically felt here, but interpreted here. Then we have our primary visual cortex, where visual information goes directly to the occipital, occipital lobe at this area. But then we have our visual association area, which is going to interpret that uh, information. And then we have the same thing with hearing. We have a primary auditory cortex, which is going to be here. But then there's an auditory association area in light blue here. And then we also have a gustatory cortex located in the insula. And we have a special area called Wernicke's area that helps us understand speech. But wait, there's more. We also have a vestibular cortex, which is where equilibrium is going to be sensed. That's our sense of balance and that's part of the insula. We have already mentioned the gustatory cortex perceives taste and is found in the insula. And the olfactory cortex, which is an awareness of odors, is found in the temporal lobe. And then we have a visceral sensory area, which is the conscious perception of visceral sensations like empty stomach, full bladder, uh, like feeling like the lungs are going to burst. And that's also located in the insula. So lots of different places for sensation. The motor and somatosensory cortices have actually been mapped out and mapped according to their ratio of what areas of the body uh, receive information or have information sent to them. For instance, if we look at the map of motor information that is sent from the brain to the body, we see that a lot of motor information goes to our tongue and for muscles involved in swallowing, as well as to our face, our lips, our jaws, our brows, our eyes, our hands, our fingers. Uh, not so much for the lower portions of our bodies. And then the same thing for the, for the primary somatosensory uh, homunculi. And this may be because we use our faces for expression and communication and also to receive uh, information, sensory information. That may be why these areas of the cortices are mapped in relation to sensation and motor information the way they are because we actually do use our hands and our faces quite a bit in terms of communication. This by the way is known as the motor and sensory homunculi, plural, homunculus is singular, and it means little man. This is going to take us to the gray matter within the cerebrum. We already know there are masses of gray matter, which are unmyelinated soma, which are the cell bodies of neurons and dendrites that can be found in the interior area of 
the cerebrum. This includes the basal nuclei, which are made up by the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. So we can see those areas of gray matter within the cerebral hemisphere. So they're actually marked in pink. This part is the head of the caudate nucleus. So you can see a little bit of the tail of it down here. It's just the way it's been divided. Actually, it's a transverse or horizontal division that you can see here. In terms of the functions of these collections of gray matter, the basal nuclei is involved in subconscious control of skeletal muscle tone and the coordination of learned movement patterns. So things like walking or riding a bike, uh, playing the piano, those are learned movement patterns. And it helps to filter out incorrect or inappropriate responses as well as playing a role in cognition and emotion, the basal nuclei help to play a role in providing pattern and rhythm of body movements as well as stopping, starting, and monitoring the intensity of motion. If we look at the basal nuclei, remember we said it includes the caudate nucleus, which you can see the whole thing here in green. We saw the head of it in the other picture, and we saw the tail of it down here. You can see how it curves around. Then we also have the putamen, which is this area here in light blue, and deep to that is the globus pallidus. So those are the three structures of the basal nuclei. The limbic system is a system that helps to link our emotions to memories and to the autonomic nervous system, which is that fight or flight or food mood, feed, breed, rest, digest part of our nervous system as well as to uh, hormones, our eating habits, our sense of smell. The limbic system is often referred to as the motivational system, and it includes different structures which are made up by the amygdala. The amygdala is important in helping produce facial exper uh, expressions when a person is really scared. Uh, and the amygdala also plays a role in fear and fight or flight. Uh, when a person is experiencing fear, it's usually the amygdala usually lights up. It's interesting that they did a study on serial killers and they found that serial killers had a very small developed amygdala. It was smaller than a normal person's amygdala because, and, and they found that, that serial killers don't fear getting caught. Um, so I just thought that was kind of a, an interesting study. The cingulate gyrus, which you can see right up in here, on the left-hand side in kind of this green area. Uh, the cingulate gyrus helps express emotions by way of gestures. The hippocampus is an area of the brain that is involved in short-term learning and memory. And then we have the hypothalamus, which is located right about here. It's anterior to this little round mammillary body. Here's the mammillary body. I'm whiting it out. Okay, so the hypothalamus is right in here. 
and the hypothalamus is the emotional connection to our organs internally, our visceral connection, so that bad feeling in the gut, that's the connection right there. Lateralization refers to the fact that usually one side of the brain dominates when it comes to certain activities. And when we look at lateralization or the dominance of one side over the other, what we find is that the cerebral hemisphere on the left side controls approximately 80% in terms of motor control of the right side of the body, whereas the right cerebral hemisphere will have motor control over 80% of the left side of the body. This means that there's 20% where motor control is able to come from the same side or the same cerebral hemisphere. The left side of the brain or the left hemisphere is usually associated with verbal, linguistic, uh, detail-oriented, practical, concrete, sequential types of processing in terms of information, whereas the right hemisphere tends to be more associated or more commonly associated with things that are visual, spatial, emotional, abstract, um, artistic types of information processing. And remember that the two cerebral hemispheres are connected by the corpus callosum, which is basically a tract of white matter of axons, myelinated axons that include about 200 million nerve fibers. That's a lot. The diencephalon includes the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the optic chiasma, the pineal gland, which is part of the epithalamus, the fornix, and the mammillary bodies. Remember, we're only looking at half of the, this portion of the central nervous system. So when I say mammillary bodies, then it only has mammillary body on the picture. You're looking at one of two. The thalamus consists of two egg-shaped masses of nuclei. Remember, a nucleus is a collection of nerve cell bodies and dendrites, unmyelinated gray matter. And the thalamus is connected one mass to the other by a special structure known as the intermediate mass, sometimes also known as the interthalamic adhesion that actually extends through the third ventricle. And each portion of the thalamus forms the superior lateral wall of the third ventricle. And the thalamus acts as a major relay station for all sensory impulses except those for smell and proprioception. So all incoming sensory impulses except those for smell and proprioception have to go through the thalamus prior to going to the cerebral cortex. And the thalamus helps to sort out and edit the information. It's involved in memory and emotion and also helps to relay information from the basal nuclei to somatic motor areas. The hypothalamus is found just interior to the thalamus. If this is the thalamus, you'll see the hypothalamus is kind of a little W type of shape structure. And the hypothalamus is really important in terms of homeostasis. This is our control center for homeostasis, and it also is involved in controlling the autonomic nervous system. Whenever you hear the words autonomic nervous system or see the words autonomic nervous system, I want you to think in your brain either 
sympathetic fight flight or parasympathetic food mood feed breed rest and digest the hypothalamus helps initiate physical responses to emotion like rage or running away when a person is scared it also helps initiate physical responses and movements during sexual activity it regulates body temperature food intake water balance our response of feeling thirsty it helps regulate sleep and wake cycles in fact there is a special nucleus in the hypothalamus that i want you to know about the suprachiasmatic nucleus is what helps regulate sleep and wake cycles the hypothalamus also is important in controlling endocrine system function in fact two different hormones are synthesized by the hypothalamus those include antidiuretic hormone adh which basically tells your body don't pee okay antidiuretic don't pee so antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin which is that chemical that causes uterine contraction as well as contraction of smooth muscle around the mammary glands to eject milk when an infant is nursing um, oxytocin is a bonding hormone that is also released during uh, uterine contractions with orgasm so um, those two hormones antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin are produced by the hypothalamus the mammillary bodies are named so because they reminded someone of little breasts you can see one here in this top picture on the right it's highlighted in orange and you can see one down here on the lower picture right about here so the mammillary bodies got their names because they looked like little breasts when somebody looked at them and described them they're located in uh, posterior to the hypothalamus and they are helpful in processing olfactory information olfactory information is information that has to do with the sense of smell and they're also important in controlling reflex movements like chewing licking swallowing sucking those are all uh, reflex movements that are controlled by the mammillary bodies the pineal gland got its name because when somebody looked at it here she thought it was shaped like a little pine cone we have the pineal gland in this upper picture here and way up here they made a bigger picture of it here's the pineal gland on this picture that's on the portion that's been enlarged now the pineal gland is often referred to as the biological clock because it produces melatonin when the eyes are subjected to light during the day and then it releases melatonin into the bloodstream at night when light levels decrease and it works in conjunction with the hypothalamus remember the suprachiasmatic nucleus which suprachiasmatic means just above the optic chiasm which is a crossing of the optic nerves which sense light the suprachiasmatic nucleus is truly truly the biological clock so please know that for me um, the pineal gland does play a role in this but literally the suprachiasmatic nucleus is that part of of the hypothalamus that senses light information and that portion of the the brain when overstimulated with electronic light from somebody playing on a cell phone for too long or an iPad or a computer is what causes uh, a lot of people to suffer from insomnia you know no matter how much light they may get to produce melatonin during the day um, if that suprachiasmatic nucleus is being overstimulated the person will still not sleep so um, 
I want you to know that for me, please. The brain is connected to the spinal cord by way of a structure called the brain stem. The brain stem is immediately inferior to the diencephalon that we just discussed. And the brain stem consists of three main portions, the mesencephalon or midbrain, which you can see in light green on your screen in this picture here. Then the pons, which is colored in light gray. And then in, inferior to the pons, we see the medulla oblongata. You'll notice there is a black line separating portions of the mesencephalon where the light green is. The black line that separates these structures represents a portion of the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct is filled with cerebrospinal fluid connecting the third and fourth ventricles, which are fluid-filled spaces in the brain and brainstem. Posterior to the cerebral aqueduct is an area of the mesencephalon or midbrain known as the corpora quadrigemina. The term corpora simply refers to body, quad means four. And there are four lumps of nervous tissue. Each one is referred to as a colliculus. Therefore, there are two superior colliculi, that is the plural form of the word, which act as reflex centers for vision, and two inferior colliculi, which act as reflex centers for hearing. When a flash of light is seen, the head reflexively turns toward the direction of the flash of light when the superior colliculi are stimulated. When a person hears a loud bang, his or her head will reflexively turn to the direction of that loud sound in response to the reflex centers of the inferior colliculi being stimulated. Now there's an easy way to remember which is which. All you have to do is remember that the pupils of your eyes, which let light in to stimulate the retina, where all the nervous tissue is in your eyes, the pupil of your eyes is superior to the external auditory meatus, which is the opening for sound for your ears. So superior colliculi is superior to the opening for your ears. So hearing is the inferior colliculi. Superior colliculi eyes, inferior colliculi ears, because your eye openings for stimulus is superior to the opening for your ears for stimulus. And because I am battling a cold, I'm going to disappear from your screen and I apologize for the nasal sound in this video recording. Anteriorly on the midbrain, you'll notice that there are lumps, and you can see these lumps in the picture inferior to the one above. These lumps represent the cerebral peduncles, and a peduncle is a foot process. You can see that slight bulging area anteriorly in the mesencephalon right here. And the cerebral peduncles are basically made up of myelinated axons. Remember, groups of myelinated axons in the central nervous system that run in the same physical direction are referred to as tracks. So the cerebral peduncles are basically made up of tracks of neurons, and there are descending motor axons that carry information 
from the primary motor cortex that's found in the precentral gyrus right in front of the central sulcus. So the neuron cell bodies live here and their axons run through the cerebral peduncles. And those are myelinated axons, therefore they are white matter. And there are also, also ascending axons carrying sensory information to the thalamus. Now, the descending motor fibers are often referred to as pyramidal tracts because many of these fibers, the majority of those fibers, will also run through a structure in the medulla oblongata that's called the pyramid. So these are often referred to as pyramidal tracts. There's also a group of neuron cell bodies found in the mesencephalon or midbrain that are referred to as the substantia nigra. They're called the substantia nigra because they're darker in color. That's because the neurons in this area produce the protein pigment melanin, which actually serves as a precursor for the neurotransmitter dopamine. And the substantia nigra is functionally linked to the basal nuclei because it has axons that will project to the putamen, which is one of those structures included in the basal nuclei. It's actually degeneration of the dopamine releasing neurons in the substantia nigra that are the ultimate cause of Parkinson's disease. This takes us to the middle portion of the brainstem referred to as the pons. And the pons is that bulging region in the brainstem that is found between the midbrain and the medulla oblongata. And in the posterior aspect or dors dorsal aspect, the fourth ventricle separates the pons from the little brain or cerebellum, which you can see in this lower picture on the lateral view, there's the cerebellum. And right anterior to the cerebellum, you'll see the black area that is the fourth ventricle. The word pons means bridge, and the pons acts to help relay information from the cerebellum by way of the projection of axons or fibers to the cerebrum, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. So it bridges all these structures together. It also contains the nuclei, which you remember are just collections of neuron cell bodies of special cranial nerves, cranial nerves five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, those nuclei for those nerves are found within the pons. The pons also works in conjunction with the medulla oblongata to adjust breathing rhythms and helps to carry incoming sensory information to the thalamus as well as descending motor commands to cranial and spinal nerves. Here we have the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata has those special structures that I mentioned previously known as pyramids. We can see the pyramids anteriorly on this picture. And those pyramids act as relay stations for sensory information coming in ascending, going up to the brain to be 
processed as well as for motor information going down from the brain towards the spinal cord. The pyramids are going to cross at a specific point and they call that the decussation of the pyramids and that's how motor information from one side of the brain gets to the opposite side of the body and 80% of motor information is going to cross at the pyramidal decussations. There are also special centers in the medulla oblongata called cardiovascular centers and these cardiovascular centers are going to help to adjust the force of the contraction of the heart as well as the rate of contractions that the heart does per minute. The cardiovascular centers will also be responsible for changing the diameter of blood vessels, thereby regulating blood pressure. If the diameter of a blood vessel increases, that will cause blood pressure to de decrease. If the diameter of a blood vessel gets smaller, that means there's more pressure in that vessel and that would increase blood pressure. There are also respiratory centers within the medulla oblongata, which will help to generate and regulate the rate and rhythm and depth of breathing as well as non-vital resources like vomiting, coughing, hiccuping, swallowing, sneezing. If you start to hiccup, you can always blame it on your medulla oblongata. Now I wanna bring your attention to the fact that on this picture, you'll notice the reticular formation is noted uh, in the area of the medulla oblongata. The reticular formation is actually made up of groups of nuclei that are found throughout the brain stem, and we'll discuss that in just a little bit. You'll also notice that there are nuclei for other cranial nerves. We have nuclei for the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10. We also have nuclei for the hypoglossal nerve, which is cranial nerve 12, and the vestibular nuclei and cochlear nuclei of cranial nerve 8, which is actually the vestibulocochlear nerve. Uh, you don't have to remember all of these structures for me and, and where the nuclei are located for these cranial nerves. Please don't drive yourself silly to do that. I do want you to know about the centers found in the medulla oblongata and what their functions are. Okay, that's important. The reticular formation is made up of groups of nuclei in the brainstem and these nuclei are responsible for controlling the levels of brain activity. One of the outstanding features of the neurons is that they have axons that go to lots of different places. They have axons that project to the hypothalamus, the thalamus, as well as lots of different areas of the cerebral cortex, which you can see in this picture. They also have axons that extend to the cerebellum and to the spinal cord. And the reticular formation makes up a system known as the reticular activating system, which sends a continuous stream of impulses to the cerebral cortex to keep the cortex alert and conscious and enhancing its excitability. And the reticular activating system um, also involves duties that include motor control, cardiovascular control, the modulation of pain 
impulses. It's also involved in sleep and habituation. The reticular activating system also helps habituate us to noise, but will wake us to other noises like a baby crying. So it really helps filter out things like normally we're not aware of the sensation of our clothes on our skin or a lot of other sensory information that is surrounding us. We filter out a lot of that and the reticular formation helps to filter that. And this system of nuclei is also inhibited by alcohol tranquilizers and sleeping pills. So it's kind of interesting. The reticular activating system, which is part of the reticular formation, is involved in uh, the brain being alert and aware, but is also involved in deep sleep. And sometimes people have this sensation when they're waking up where they feel like they're awake, but they're paralyzed. They can't move. And that's usually because the reticular activating system has been suppressed. Sometimes antihistamines can suppress the system. So if a person takes an antihistamine prior to going to bed, it may cause this kind of sleep paralysis phenomenon to occur upon waking, where they can sense stuff going around them, but they can't move or speak. So the term cerebellum means little brain, and the cerebellum is important because it's going to help process input received from the cerebral motor cortex, as well as various nuclei in the brain stem and sensory receptors. And the cerebellum is important for providing precise timing as well as the appropriate patterns of muscle contraction in order to have smooth, efficient motion that is required for daily activities of living like driving or typing or playing an instrument. And the cerebellum has tiny little folds uh, that are called folia. The word folia actually means leaves, and those are the tiny little gyri that you see on the surface of the cerebellum that help to increase surface area because the cortex of the cerebellum, like the cortex of the cerebrum, is made up of gray matter. And you remember that gray matter is unmyelinated soma and their dendrites, okay? And soma are the neuron cell bodies. There is myelinated white matter inside the cerebellum that when sliced open, the white matter has the appearance of a white tree. And therefore, it is called the arbor vitae, the tree of life. So the cerebellum is held on posteriorly to the brainstem by three cerebellar peduncles, foot processes, that are basically tracks that help carry information in and out of the cerebellum. So the superior cerebellar peduncles help uh, connect the cerebellum and midbrain, carrying information to the cerebral motor cortex by way of the thalamus. And the middle cerebellar peduncles are actually uh, attached by way of the pons to the cerebellum. So there are one-way communications advising the cerebellum of motor activity initiated by that voluntary motor cortex. And then the inferior cerebellar peduncles, um, some books say that they uh, originate from the medulla and the spinal cord. Some just say the medulla. I don't care either way. They're basically conveying sensory information to the cerebellum from proprioceptors, which are those special sensory receptors that tell your body what position it has in space, 
as well as from the vestibular nuclei of the brain and those are concerned with balance those the vestibular nuclei of the brain stem are receiving signals from the inner ear uh, regarding balance or equilibrium here we can see that sagittal view of the cerebellum you can see the different cerebellar peduncles the superior cerebellar peduncle coming from the midbrain and the middle cerebellar peduncle coming from the pons and then the inferior cerebellar peduncle even though it looks like it's just uh, posterior to the pons is actually coming from uh, the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord according to most textbooks here we see the gray matter which looks like light brown in this picture that's the cerebellar cortex and then the arbor vitae is that tree of life that is the white matter that you see in the cerebellum you can also see the fourth ventricle and I want to point out on this particular picture you'll see this little blob of red called the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle remember that the ependymal cells which are glial cells help produce cerebrospinal fluid and they're actually found lining the ventricles and they're basically also on the surface of the choroid plexus so they take a, a certain substances going through the blood vessels that make up that network that plexus and produce cerebrospinal fluid with it so I just wanted to point that out on this picture we'll see it again this takes us to again functions of the cerebellum it is an automatic processing center and so we don't consciously think of the things that the cerebellum does I'm going to live vicariously and put this on I know I don't look great because I'm sick but that's okay uh, so the cerebellum helps us to do rapidly coordinated movements and the motor areas of the cerebral cortex are going to notify the cerebellum of the intent to move and the cerebellum helps to adjust postural muscles maintaining balance and equilibrium while working in concert with proprioceptors giving information to our body uh, so we know where we are in space to do these movements as well as information from the inner ears again so we can balance ourselves when we're moving and this allows our body to coordinate muscle movements and compare conscious movements with the proprioceptive information that's being sent upward in order to create smooth movements if there's an injury to the cerebellum that means there's going to be a loss of coordination and potentially muscle tone which is ataxia so if you try to test somebody with ataxia and you have and you hold an object or I'll hold my cup of tea the person with ataxia can't coordinate himself to touch the object obviously I am not ataxic I can touch the cup of tea I've watched some interesting videos uh, that were done with people who were born without a cerebellum and they're very rare I think there's only two maybe three documented cases worldwide and what I thought was really interesting is that people who don't have a cerebellum um, take a lot longer to learn how to do things like walk or ride a bike other parts of the brain have to kick in to make up for the loss of the cerebellum but one of the things I found interesting is that people who don't have a cerebellum also have a very flat affect they have no um, process for emotion and um, have a hard time establishing relationships with other people because 
they don't respond to emotional cues and don't feel and process emotions themselves. So there's obviously a lot more going on with the cerebellum than we understand. It's not just involved in coordinating motion. There's a lot more involved in it, but there's a lot of studies that have yet to be done. When we look at a microscopic view of the cerebellum, and hopefully you'll get to see this in lab, you can see there are distinct layers of the cerebellar cortex. You can see that there is an inner granular cell layer that is located adjacent to the arbor vitae. And then there is a layer of special cells called Purkinje cells. They're very large. And then an outer layer called the molecular layer. And the Purkinje cells are really uh, large cells. They have uh, extensive branches of dendrites, and those can form up to 200,000 synapses. And what's kind of interesting is that the Purkinje cells are the only cortical cells that have axons that are myelinated that will go to very small areas of central nuclei, gray matter, deep within the cerebellum. So just like we have some gray matter in the cerebrum, there's some small deep nuclei in the cerebellum, and the axons of the Purkinje cells will actually go there.